Which one of which one of these is the one? Push, push both. Either one of them. Just what? New new machinery to me. Push the other the other one? Push the other one? Yeah. There you go. You got it. Oh, okay. Um before you not Oh, good. I can see your faces. So nice. For a little while, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm going to present a, a series of projects that I've done, three projects, uh, over the past few years. And uh, uh, but at first, I wanted to show you all a few of the paintings that I've been doing. That's the did that. Um, here we are. When I was uh, first a student in architecture, I had the lucky opportunity to um, study with a man named Leonardo Ricci. And uh, Leo was really an amazing character. God only knows why he ended up in Kentucky. He uh, was the dean of Florence, had done a series of buildings in Italy, and uh, one moment uh, fell in love with this woman. Her name is Maria. Uh, affectionately referred to everyone by as Pucci. And Pucci was the reason that Leo ended up in Kentucky, of all places. Uh, that time I spent with them taught me a great deal about what mattered in life. Uh, each night uh, we would go to their house, climb the stairs. Uh, an old uh, German mason had done the building there. And oddly enough, it's a building that's very near where my mother was born. And so for me, uh, it was very strange to have this internationally renowned architect there in this small town, so close to my mother's home and so close to my own home. And it brought it uh, to me in a very different way than perhaps the usual experience that we have in architecture school. We would, me and a few other students would always come up to Leo and Pucci's apartment, paint it all white and uh, smell of bread, cooking, food in the kitchen, they would, Pucci would be fixing her hair and Leo would be uh, playing a game of solitaire. Jack of diamonds, seven of spades, he'd be saying, looking at the cards. And, ah, ah, who is at the door? Oh, come here, Michelino. He would always call me Michelino. His teacher was Michelucci, which meant Mich Michele, Michael, the master, and Michelino, which meant Michael, the baby. <laughs> so I've, I've never, never escaped his title of him, of being Michael, the baby. And, Till the day he died, I was always Michelino. Uh, this meant a lot. The way that he brought us into his home, he and Pucci, she was also a very refined woman and an amazing architect uh, herself. Very cultured, fluent in, in Spanish, Italian, English, French, all of which she spoke at a very rapid and staccato speed, as is common for the Venetians. She, uh, uh, she drove him, I think, to uh, heights of creativity that no other thing could, and I think perhaps that's the only reason why he suffered this miserable little town, uh, Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, because there's no other reason that, they, that he could have possibly been there than the fact that she had uh, been brought there and offered a tenure position. So we would, we would arrive, we'd be greeted, you know, there would be all these smells in the house, and uh, Leo would be unrolling drawings. One of the amazing things to me about Leo is that uh, uh, at age 78, uh, when I first met him, he was still painting, still drawing every day, not the kind of signature architects that do architecture with a wave of their hand. Various characters in their office are doing all the work. They do a little scribble, kind of wave their hand around. And all you guys and all of your talents are there. On the contrary, uh, uh, with Leo, there were uh, piles and piles of drawings, piles and piles of sketches. And he didn't really bring us uh, into the house to, to do his work. He brought us there to uh, uh, have us work with him. In fact, I could never actually figure out why it was that he had us there. Because uh, uh, in many respects, in the final account, we did very little. Uh, he would show up and he would lay down a huge roll of paper. And he'd leave this game of solitaire for a moment. And it was strange to me that game of solitaire because I myself remember it from when I was a child because I grew up uh, in a little A-frame house on the Kentucky River 
And now there I was, and I mean, really by me, on the Kentucky River. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so to see again this game of solitaire being played by this very cultured 78 year old Italian has this strange kind of uh, resonance and remembrance for me. He would lay out this drawing and he would set us down and he would say, okay, now we begin. And he would have these sketches and he would lay out the first few lines. And uh, he would say, now, make this curve. And we draw out the curve and he goes, stop. Because the first thing I want to tell you is to know nothing. I don't know. What do you mean, know nothing? This is coming from someone who knew Jean-Paul Sartre and you know, was friends with Picasso and stayed uh, in, the, in the Kaufman house, was guest in the Kaufman, kind of very culture man, and looking at the architecture. Culture means everything, but if you're going to be an architect, you want to know Too often, when we look at the problem, we already apply preconceived notions. And our problem is that we must make an architecture that's pertinent to our time, for our concern, and for the materials of construction that are in our time, and for the people that it's going to help. And I said, okay, so forget about this one. Because, you know, we don't need to do that. But when you begin this time, you know what? Don't spend enough time to stop the problem. We're always applying the previous post But in fact, we can say architecture is about prevention and supply. No one tells them the overlooks because everything, every dimension of the problem is to make an adventure. So I said, okay, So I sat down and started to draw the curve and go, no, stop. I said, Leo, it's your curve. And he goes, no, I've washed your hands. It's not my curve. Because when you draw this line, you have to draw this line with the brick in your hand. You have to feel the brick in your hand. I said, well, feel the brick in your hand? He says, this wall is to be made of brick. And so when you draw this line, I want you to think about the brick and hold the weight of the brick in your hand and think about the man who has to lay the brick. I said, OK. He goes, but more than that, when you draw this line, I want you to hold this brick in your hand and think about a mother who has a crying child beside her and she has to comfort this child. Okay, well, so this person's all I draw very slowly, very cautiously this curve, which is more or less a piece of a circle and an arc looking somewhat like the contour of a womb. He was obsessed with certain geometries uh, that were inherited from Rye, but also from other traditions. And uh, I was drawing kind of very nervously now at this point. It stopped me so many times. I pulled out a lot of paper. And uh, I said, okay. And he looks, and he basically goes, okay, I'll come back. Oh, oh shit. All right. He goes into the room and he starts playing solitaire again. Nine of diamonds, I hear him say. Queen of spades. He goes, it's all possibilities. It's all chance. He's like mummering in you know, all possibilities. All chance. He comes back in and he looks what I'm doing. He goes, oh, good. And he comes back to the neck. I'm back in the neck. I'm like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that line down, you know? <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is one curve, right? And uh, uh, so we're looking, we're looking at this and he goes, now we can talk. And he says, the first thing that you must understand is that form is not an object, but form is the potential in vitality. Excuse me, I want to remember exactly what he said. He said, the potential vitality intrinsic in an object. I was like, what does this mean? Potential vitality intrinsic in an object. Okay. So I look and I say, all right, you mean that this form or I think again. I pause. I start to talk. I pause again. And he explains to me, any form is not a question of what the object is, but it's more a question of what it potentially can be. What is the possibility of that object? That any object, if it has plasticity, if it has form, it has a life inside of it. It has an energy inside of it. And that this life must be nurtured, that it is on the path, and it is not an object. So 
says, well, the problem of architecture is a problem of free will. And free will is not a, a goal. It's not a thing that you can have. But it's a perpetual search in perpetual motion, never ending. A problem which is never ending. So I thought, well, this is my first lesson in architecture. We sit down, we eat, we drink, he rolls the drawings, he starts to sing, he starts to stand on a chair, he takes off his shirt, you know, it's like fat, like this, this guy coming out. And his wife is pushing, she's running around now, she's crying, and lay, lay, get out of the chair, you'll hurt yourself, you're gonna kill yourself. She was like 20 years younger than him, right? He, he knew vitality, and he was drunk as hell on Kentucky whiskey, standing on this chair in the middle of this absurd town, the country I want, and, and finally like, she goes running off into the bedroom. This is, this is my first lesson. She goes running off into the bedroom, the bedroom is fine. Clang, clang, clang. She gets down off the chair and puts in the whole time and goes, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to leave. I don't know what it was. We were looking at the both of them like they were crazy. And he looks at us and he smiles. Now all of a sudden, almost dead sober. And he goes, OK, time to go. Class is over. So he goes, three of us down the stairs. And we realized that, uh, and the reason why I gave this lecture the title Body Matters is because what he was teaching us wasn't that architecture was about, oh, you know, it's all these complex issues all the time we're contending with. Of course, you know, there's all these issues, you know, you know, sometimes talk about the legal architecture, you talk about the decisions, and so But in the final step, what really matters is the commonality of the human body and the commonality of human experience. And he's going to teach us anything about architecture. He has a great design for Africa. He has made the flow right in front of us. It had, it had to matter. Our lives had to matter. Here. And that semester was uh, one of the most uh, wonderful and amazing semesters in my life. And I think it's changed me forever. I don't know that uh, my work honors him, but I hope it does. And the uh, uh, last year that I left Kentucky was the year that he died. I was thinking about this before I came here tonight. Uh, I had a stomach flu for about a week. And uh, terrible flu. I was thinking about what to talk about. What are you going to tell these people? And uh, Yuski drug me out in the desert. And in this desert, you know, with Yuski, somehow I got well. All the cars came by, and him going like 40 miles an hour. And he goes, I like this one. And all of a sudden, I thought, you know, it's like Yuski is in touch with that spirit that Leo had. And all of a sudden, it all came back to me, what mattered. And my stomach, it went away. So, <laughs> you're lucky to lay over next year. You can have to do So, the first project that I wanted to present tonight is a project called Twin Cinema. It's a project that I did in the, uh, 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 for a Cinema Institute. And the thing that I was interested in this project was why do they want another institution on this site? Because the site itself is a very complex site. There are many things that were happening on it. There were, were bombs who slept there. There were uh, uh, vagrants bazaars that was always happening. It was near NYU and Cooper Union and all these various schools. So there was always a kind of youthful, youthful life there. And I thought, well, no, no, no. This, this, this ten-story building that they want for this site is not what I want to bring here. What is it that I want to bring here? There's a very complex array of forces. Some of the forces you can see here, the matrices of the, of the uh, street energy, uh, the diagonals coming from the fact that people cross this site. And it was one of these curious sites where Broadway actually crosses one of the main accesses. It's where Broadway crosses uh, Third Street and actually becomes a bowery. So it's one of these very pivotal sites in New York, and all of them are marked by clocks. All of them are marked by time. They're actually very crucial sites in the city. Uh, so what I thought I wanted to do was to make a vertical piazza for this site. Not another institution, not another locked key building that was exclusive, but something that was about inclusivity, that welcomed uh, many types of people, and that was basically heterotopic in nature that it dealt with a broad array of forces instead of a kind of institutional hierarchy that they wanted to situate on the site. So what I decided to do was then to make two buildings, first of all, not one building. 
and that these two buildings would somehow combine and opposites, and it would be the joining of opposites. Uh, not opposites in opposition, but opposites which flow together and become one. Uh, so these two buildings were going to house different activities, and under each of them, in the foundation, would be the cinemas required for the existing program. In one building, the upper one on the right is an inflated building, and inside of that I put uh, 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 museum, uh, uh, experimental cinema, experimental theater, uh, uh, various other program like this. And in the other building, which you see a cross-section of right there, uh, were rooms for the homeless, meeting rooms, uh, space underneath uh, for the, the vagrants to still lay out their wares and, for, and, and these ramps for uh, skateboarders and skate rats to skate over the building. Uh, one inflated, the other one deflated or flat. Uh, another aspect, I guess, of the, of the architecture which uh, might be a curious one to you is that uh, I've been interested in in the plastic content of nature for a long time. And when I arrived in New York City, I began to what, wonder what this meant with regard to the, mecha the mechanistic 19th century city, the machine city. And one of the things that, that I was fascinated the most by were the automobiles, especially the taxi cabs. So it was one of the models for the building was the automobile and the taxi cab. And in, in some respect, I tried to take the energies of the site the energies of the, uh, the movement of peoples on this site, uh, memory of the automobile now in a much larger scale than, than what it had. And to these two structures precariously parked on the site, like the cars that are now parked on the site. Uh, there's another image. I've been playing a little bit with a uh, uh, montage with these uh, models to show the complexity of scale that they have. So in the first image, you see the model against the city, and now you see it against the snow drift. And you start to have an understanding that uh, one of the key interests for mine in, in, in attempting to develop a kind of plastic language in architecture is that the building be scaleless. And by that, I don't mean that it isn't humanist, uh, but not humanist in the traditional sense. Uh, I'm definitely interested in this building as a place for people to occupy. In fact, there are these uh, ramps that go out from it, which are uh, lover's leaps, so that you can uh, go out and jump if you know, the, the mood strikes you. Uh, quite serious about that, although I don't think the competition, it was in the text, I don't think it went over very well with the competition judges. <laughs> but most importantly for me is this idea of this building as a kind of uh, topological concern, this building as a site. Uh, this issue of scalelessness, uh, it's quite important to me because I think that uh, there is a possibility that architecture can exist at many scales and that the building form which we emerge from can speak at many scales. And that starts to talk about different aspects of our psyche. It starts to talk about the space of dream as well as the space of reality, or what we call reality. Here you can see uh, Geometries, which I originated by studying the sites and studying certain movements of people on the site, uh, certain radius of, 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 of car automobile movement, as well as uh, 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 skateboard uh, ramp radiuses. I got all the and uh, laid those all to a kind of flat topological surface, and then folded both buildings out of the same plane. Kind of a, a, a challenge for me, both a kind of philosophical concern with regard to saying that both of these clients, the homeless and the, and the people who have homes, uh, can exist in the same suit of clothes, but maybe they wear them differently. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, 
I used to do a lot of architectural drawings, you know, originate projects by doing drawings, plans, sections, elevations. Uh, but for the past 10 years, I've only worked in model first and done always the drawings actually. Uh, the only kind of drawings I've been doing uh, uh, to generate uh, architectural form anymore have to do with uh, traces of activity, traces of forms, shadows, compressions of the body having been there, uh, traces of movement, uh, city matrices, and very flat dimensional surfaces, and then deforming those according to uh, uh, certain plastic intentions. And then once developing a two-dimensional model, then going back and studying that in drawing. So uh, the, although the sections are, heads are in the way of, are actually quite reasonable because the ability to study them all, once you find the appearance of the plants, you actually get quite curious. So here you can see the spaces where the uh, homeless, the rooms where the homeless are sleeping, and the uh, one of the settlers are coming. This is a section of one of the uh, meeting rooms, uh, and the section of the meeting room. Oh, that's wrong. Uh, quite a while ago. Ten years later. Before we were about this story. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'd like to read a text that I wrote for this project, and I hope it, uh, I hope it doesn't disturb you that I'm going to read. This is a project that I have about uh, sand dragons. It was a project that I did for uh, Jamaica Bay in New York, in which I attempted to deal with some of the issues of uh, uh, fluctuation of scale and various ways in which we understand site today, given our uh, ability to fly, human satellites, have microscopes, um, many different scales that we exist in today. From a prison cell, the age of Marco Polo diligently recounts his progress in the East, selecting with care the details of the unfamiliar and improbable, not once to shed the imprint of his native Venice, the known quantity against which all is measured. So too did my destiny carry me to the East, guided by a desire beyond the confines of distance or orientation. In this, I sought to draw to the surface something which is certainly unfamiliar, albeit grounded in otherwise familiar domains. Sand Dragons is a project conducted over the course of two years in New York, principal port of the unfamiliar, and my native Kentucky. It is aptly subtitled Transient Housing. Both the shelters and the anticipated occupants are transient. The site, the marshy land masses of Jamaica Bay, under the shadow of, depart of, under the shadow of departures, from John F. Kennedy International Airport has informed both the program and the nature of the structures which mediate land, sea, and air realms of reflection and transversal. Site, program, structure, each are possessed with a corresponding sense of transience. Here must, we must consider the idea of scale. The passenger jet comes in close overhead, rupturing Excuse me. I shouldn't look at this slide, should I? <laughs> yes. Close overhead, rupturing the vapors and recalling the constellational vision of the outlying kings and queens counties. We are in flight, at night, descending. In this realm, scale, perspective, historical and metaphorical, descend and ascend with the frequency of passenger jets. Architecture embraces the land sea and is embraced by it. The shelters, new arrivals, transfigured cargo, laments to the lost chapels of the airport, position themselves in this atmosphere in which other is native. Their occupation of the marshy dunes mimics the dunes' occupation of the bay, anticipating the desperate sort of human occupation that is its formative agent. As the Venetian lacuna serves as the surface of exchange between east and west, so too the sand dragons stand as a witness of exchange between the legendary topographies of China, vis-a-vis -vis the geomancer's positioning meanings in the embrace of earth, sea, and air, and the imprint 
of the enveloping maternal landscape of my native Kentucky. The convergence of these seemingly desperate elements and this project result in an important reformation of the value of site model. This site is not modeled as an erasure, idealized tabula rasa, whose monological domination of the realm of the given is the basis of the essential poverty of current architectural practice, founded as it is upon the tyranny of the plan and the bulldozer, but rather the terra or land site is posited as a corruption upon the stillness of the realm. The architect is to renegotiate a stillness in the corruption that is implicit to dwell. tonight. I was also going to read you a text. Uh, I did for uh, uh, a competition for uh, San Francisco, the AIDS Life Center. And I'm sure it does not go over well. I think uh, one of the problems for every life AIDS Life Center, uh, it's both a memorial uh, space of worship and a uh, uh, and housing for the AIDS program. 